Hey guys, welcome back to Daniel's Tech World here on YouTube. My name is Daniel Rosal. This is my little tech corner of the internet. And today I'm going to try to do a video that I'm going to hope will mark the end of the trip down the rabbit hole. It's not the first time actually in my life that I've, uh, you might be not surprised to know that I've really kind of delved deep into backup and archival uh, because I think it's extremely important if you are a creative person and uh, you're putting your your life's work might be put into creating photographs or videos or music for that matter and not losing that data becomes very very important to a good amount of people um, so most people yes certainly they put it on the cloud and they they think that that's good enough and it is probably good enough for uh, for most people but uh, physical media archival remains a thing in the year 2024 and this year I did my 2023 archiving and as I was doing that my uh, CD my my blu-ray burner broke broke down which kind of uh, put me into researching a little bit more about optical and I came out with this knowledge which I'm going to share here today in this guide which is gonna I'm gonna try and make this as thorough as I can maybe I'll do this once a year but not more frequently than that. This is the information I pulled together uh, for uh, for 2024. So I just uh, put here in the footnotes, um, I've been fortunate enough to learn some great little nuggets of info from people commenting on these YouTube on this YouTube channel. Some people have insane archival strategies that frankly put mine to shame. Um, although you could say simplicity is a good thing, but more elaborate for sure. Um, so this is, if you have ideas or thoughts, there are some controversies in the world of optical media, please continue to, uh, to share them. And this is just my best attempt at summarizing what I've learned. So, um, I don't guarantee everything is 100% perfect. I'm human and I make, uh, I get stuff wrong from time to time. So feel free to correct me if I, uh, if I screwed up, um, so let's just kind of look at the big picture firstly, but we're going to talk about everything in this presentation. I'm going to try, I know that's a bold claim, but everything that I think is relevant to optical media in 2024. But let's start with the objections, right? It seems very odd. We talked about Google Drive and cloud storage. So why would you want to burn your disks in 2024? So I started out with the objections um, and I didn't actually include one objection, but I think it's actually better addressed just by talking about it, right? So the issue with cloud, I have a lot of issues with cloud. I love the cloud. I use cloud for pretty much everything. Uh, accounting, emails, Google Drive, Google Photos, my life's on the cloud. But unlike most people, I think that that data needs to be protected. By which I mean, I consider the cloud to be the working copy of my data. And under a classic backup approach, 321, I need to retain two more copies of that cloud data. Uh, I do that for my cloud data periodically. It's a little bit complicated how I do it. I even do that for my SaaS data. You, if you're really interested, look up the videos, how I back up SaaS. Um, but that is my posture for using cloud computing is I like it. I think it's great, but I don't want that to be my the, the only copy of important data that I keep. Hence, I got into optical media. Uh, and I got into optical, I used to use cloud to back up cloud. I used to use Backblaze B2 and Amazon Glacier and all the common products that are out there in the market. But I love the idea of being able to keep your own physical copies of data. Um, I love that idea. It's uh, it's very empowering and it reduces the dependence on third party providers. And there's all kinds of reasons why your cloud data could get destroyed through whether we're talking about ransomware propagation or we're talking about uh, 2FA lockouts or we're talking about uh, accidental user deletion. There's a lot of different scenarios and there's something very nice about committing your data to worm storage. That is storage that can only be written once, like most form of optical I'm putting it in a cabinet and doing that two or three times. And that will keep your data. If you've got good optical media, archival grade optical media, that will keep your data very, very safe for quite a significant chunk of time. And I, I never talk about optical will be great forever. I've made the point that the, the point here in archival in digital archiving, which is a relatively new discipline, if you think about it, because the digital era hasn't been going for that long it's been a it's been a flash in the uh, overall scope of human history but the point of it so far is just been moving between better storage so this is only a stopgap solution this is just saying here is a stable form of storage it'll keep your stuff good for a few decades and who knows what'll happen then hopefully there'll be something better but in 2024 we'll talk about why 
archival is still a great call for that. So, but here's why it doesn't work, okay? So yeah, we talked about LTO. On its cost per terabyte basis, uh, it's a very bad, it's an expensive form of storage, right? Um, LTO is way, way cheaper. HDD is quite a bit cheaper. Um, secondly, the process of writing disks, some people really hate it. I'd actually kind of like it. I kind of I kind of savor the, this little monthly ritual I have of uh, creating my archive disks onto the M disk, but some people think that's a nuisance. Um, a more substantive point, main, uh, perhaps, is that yes, uh, optical is kind of like frozen in time in a sense, right? You keep reading stuff. I've I lost track of how many brochures I've read that were written in the 90s, and it's uh, it's kind of fun forum threads and whatnot because. Optical reached Gen 3, Blu-ray was Gen 3, DVD was Gen 2, and CD was Gen 1. And then it kind of got stuck. Uh, it got stuck because the cloud came on the scene, uh, USB drives came on the scene which much, with much bigger capacities. It could be rewritten that didn't need to be burned. And people were like, people kind of forgot about cloud. And when they forgot, forgot about cloud, it really shifted to the attention firstly was lost. And the only attention and innovation has really been focused on the enterprise where um, innovators are still very much have the ambition that optical can and should replace LTO. And I think it should. And I think there's a good chance it will if these, you know, uh, terabyte drives ever actually make it to market at a reasonable price point. Uh, I think it's kind of crazy that a tape is still such a big thing. No disrespect to tape, it's a great technology, but I don't see any reason why uh, optical couldn't displace tape. So I think there's still a chance of that happening. The final thing is that disks take up lots of room. If you have lots of data, you need lots of disks. If you have lots of disks, you need lots of you know, lots of place to store the disks. I would say it's actually really not that, uh, depending on your data, right? I'm storing three years worth of video in like, half of a little box and it's just really not that big a deal it's like smaller than my nas but you know some people could say that's annoying um but there is one reason that optical does remain relevant and believe me it remains relevant there are i've tried to discern some of the sales volumes on amazon and they for the most common products you still see products selling like more than ten thousand units in the last month and i'm told by people in the know if you will that in uh, government uh, particularly and in certain industries, optical really remains quite relevant and important. So the reason for that is that it's relatively impervious to bit rot. Bit rot being the tendency of data to degrade, digital data to degrade over time. On optical media, we call it disk rot. Um, on tape, you can call it tape rot. You get the idea. There's no real, uh, how, how will data be lost? And everyone, I would say, okay, not everyone, but a lot of people watching this have first-hand experience with bit rot. Did you ever have, you might have had a grandfather like mine, uh, who was a avid uh, video maker and stored his stuff on tape. And uh, you might have tried to play the tape, perhaps during their lifetime, perhaps after their lifetime, and discovered that half of them were crap and the reason is that um bit rot the data was stored on the tape and over the passage of time it got lost irredeemably um and this is actually where optical is surprisingly good the process of optical media involves taking a disc using a laser now the laser disc was really the start of the optical era but for prat i don't i've never heard correct me watchers if you know otherwise of someone using a laser disc to store data it wouldn't be very efficient uh but uh so really cd was the you know we of course cd originally was used for audio dvd was used for videos but everything can be used for any kind of data essentially there's no we're basically storing ones and zeros when we're creating media. So there, you can put anything on anything, basically, right? There's no, to the best of my knowledge, there's no such thing as a audio only, that can only accept audio files. Uh, that would be strange. Um, so the process of what optical media has in common is uh, we're using a laser. And in the case of dye-based optical media, we are creating optical contrast through ablating the dye. Okay, so we chip away at the dye. Um, and in inorganic, we are ablating into an inorganic surface. Uh, we are writing, we are chipping away at that. And that's how we store the data. There is literally bumps. Uh, we're talking about nanomaterials here, but there's literally bumps and grooves 
that represent ones and zeros when the laser interprets them as, as the disk spins around. So it's actually, firstly, it's very advanced. Like uh, most forms of store, I mean, actually, I would say every kind of storage is just insane the engineering that went into it uh so you think cds are kind of primitive i would say think again it's actually like really an amazing tech um so but anyway this process is actually relatively good at retaining data now if the die is crap uh the data retention will be crap so that's what that's why for our for optical i would suggest that really the only point is is using archival grade. I would say go archival or go home for optical media. So the weird thing is that although optical um, people, I might have the chronology wrong, but certainly, you know, people think of hard drives as a more modern, certainly SSD, solid state drives, flash memory, and of course LTO. They'd say, oh yeah, these are all like way more cutting edge, if you will. But these technologies, while they offer much better capacities from a data retention and data longevity and data permanence perspective, they do not actually optical has the edge, which is actually really crazy that this old, relatively speaking, old technology of uh, creating disks can actually hold on to data better than these other ways. And the reason is that, well, hard drives store their data through magnetism, um watch videos on youtube it's all i i say again all this stuff is insanely complicated uh but that's the basic principle and therefore they're subject to bit rot through demagnetism right they lose their magnetic charge and that will if you if that happens enough times the files will be corrupt ssds also radically complicated to the nth degree you know, the product of absolutely insane, brilliant minds and incredible engineering uh, that they, they store their data through electrical charge in microscopic cells. I think that's a fair big picture uh, summary. So that technology is wonderful. But what, you know, that kind of tells you that if it's not connected to power, it's actually going to be probably a more vulnerable media than even HDDs for data longevity. And then we have flash memory kind of put in the same category. Tape, LTO. People think, well, tape is used for... For archive therefore it must be the best archival medium and they stop the conversation there and the reality is actually really not so yes it's very very cheap but think about vhs tape um that should tell you the tape data written onto tape i'm not saying that vhs tape and lto tape are the are the same uh or should be put in the same category exactly but uh data data rot does occur relatively quickly in fact for lto a lot of people say it's 30 years and um i don't know if there's any archival lto tape on the market would be interested to uh to, to hear about it if it did but even even though you still have and this is a, a point I didn't include, the cost of LTO drives are prohibitive. And your average person who just wants to store data for their home videos or their wedding photos isn't going to go out and spend $5,000 to get an LTO drive. So yeah, the cartridges are a lot cheaper, but the drive is, it's 5,000 bucks. I don't know if that's a realistic price point. My people can correct me, but it's certainly an awful lot che more expensive than buying a $100 Blu-ray driver, which will be able to write you M-Discs and everything. You don't even need to spend that much. Uh, optical, so yeah, there is, um, but then in optical, well, we've actually, we're actually comfortably exceeding all the longevities of these media for cold offline storage. Now, yes, uh, you can make these online, right? You can connect HDDs in a RAID system and have error correction and all that. So this is really just an offline uh, that optical has this advantage. Uh, and likewise for LTO and SSD. But optical, uh, just off for offline cold storage, it's weirdly, and I say it's weirdly because it's quite relatively old, it's weirdly the king uh, because it's not hard to find optical media that is rated for 50 years, some stuff for 100 years, and of course the M-Disc for 1,000 years. And you won't see that in, uh, I haven't seen that in other categories. So also for create, for creating your offsite backups, this is actually, actually, this was really my intro to optical is when I started getting into backups and I was like, Ugh, I guess I better create offsite copies because that's best practice. But what you do is a sucky DSL internet connection. Um, so putting stuff up to the cloud, if you're talking about backing up uh, lots of data, it's, uh, you know, it can put a strain on a really bad internet connection. Uh, but the old way of doing offsite backup, stuff like Iron Mountain, right? Someone physically comes and collects your tapes or you physically bring them somewhere. It's sure it's old school, but it works. Um, and uh, very easy to do that with 
CD, DVD, optical media. You can just literally put it in your luggage. That's what I do once a year. I've talked about this. Would be actually smarter to post every disc I make. And if you are lucky enough to own two properties, you can have your offsite in one and your onsite in the other, or your offsite in work and your onsite at home. You know, quite easy. Um, and you don't you don't need a lot of storage. I would contend if you're doing. But uh, well, we'll get to that. So there's actually that's actually not the only reason. Uh, so we talked about archival, but there's actually another uh, totally independent reason that optical media. Some people still use it. That's worm. We'll write once, read many times. Like most optical media, not the RW stuff, but the R stuff. Your BDRs, your CDRs, your DVDRs, and your M discs. Uh, generally, uh, media that is archival will always be worm uh, because. Um, if you kind of think about it, that makes sense, right? You, If it's rewritable, it's got to be easier to erase the data on the disk. And with archival, you want to keep the data on the disk. So those are conflicting objectives. So I would say that actually all archival media is worm. So the beauty of worm, actually, you think of it as kind of annoying, but there's actually some reasons why worm is great. Well, you can't get ransomware on a disk if there's no way to put data onto it, right? It's immutable. And that concept of immutability is also useful for financial filings and uh, stuff like that, compliance use cases, where you have to say, these are the person's medical records, either exactly as they were, of course, that's assuming no bit rot, but uh, say it's on archival media, this is exactly an uh, exact copy of the data we wrote at this date and point in time. So you can see why for compliance... Uh, war media is use is useful. Um, finally, you know, video files. People still like to collect them for their home cinema. I I understand that for streaming, optical. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because download streaming is actually quite a complex process. You're downloading pockets of information from the internet and then playing them immediately. So if you want the absolute best quality and the best sound quality, I believe uh, folks will still use uh, optical. That's kind of a holdout in the optical media for them. And then, you know, some people just like nostalgia. And again, I argue that it makes sense uh, if you're doing stuff like video, photo files, and you're doing it for archival. And you don't want to keep adding capacity to your NAS. You can really build out an optical library that scales so long as you can hold more disks. And disks, again, I really don't think they take up that much room, especially if you're buying the 100 gig disks. You can, you know, easily fit a few terabytes in uh, arguably the size of a HDD if you stack them right. So let's just assume though for this, if you're watching, if you've made it to this YouTube channel and you're watching this video, you want to use it for archival. And I made the point that archive is not backup. Backup, something you can restore from, archive data, you just you just need to keep. You can of course say that, well, isn't can't an archive be a backup? Couldn't it be both? And the answer is, I guess, yes. Um, but uh, really not exactly the same thing. There are backup use cases that are totally not archival. So what should you do? All right, let's go through all the options on the market in a, in a whistle-stop tour of all the stuff I've looked at for the past few weeks. So in CDs and DVDs, um, there are archival products uh, on the market. There are just my observations. I would say there's actually more archival CDs because um, some people still use them for mastering records, like they create a really fancy, perfect copy of the record. Uh, so there's a few kind of audio companies that have stepped up to that mark and said, okay, we'll build you, we'll build these beautiful 24 carat discs. And uh, those are rated for usually quite a long time. But uh, a bit more cheap and cheerful or more commonplace is these verbatim products. They're called the Ultra Life products. I wrote to verbatim, I said, you guys have archival grade, you have Data Life Plus. I'm confused, which is better because these ones are a lot cheaper. And they said archival grade is better. Uh, there's two reflective layers uh, and it's about two to four times the price. So that makes sense, right? Um, so personally, I would, uh, if I was doing CD or DVD, I would just go for the archival grade. I wouldn't go for anything less, uh, especially for physical reasons. Uh, with CDs, the data is right up near the top. For DVDs, it's kind of in the middle. So arguably, some people would argue um, that CDs are the most vulnerable media to, um, to, you know, the processes that can destroy CDs like moisture and delamination if you put labels on them, etc. But so the problem, so why I say CDs, why I, why I would skip these? Well, one, you've got a lot less data, obviously, but um, they're, the way they do these, the way they make these things is they put some gold in them. 
which makes them look absolutely awesome. Um, and I will absolutely be buying these at some point when my credit card is less uh, terrible than it is this month because I bought a lot of, uh, well, I bought a drive. I bought, yeah, I bought, a, I bought, I, I spent a little bit too much money on optical media this month. So at some point in the future, I want to own these because they look awesome. Uh, but um, ultimately they have, as you can see here, the ASO recording layer. So yes, they have this nice uh, buffer. Uh, gold reflective layer, silver reflective layer, right? That's called, uh, let me remember, DRT, dual reflective, DRL, dual reflective layers. So that's what makes them archival. We're, we're buffering them as another layer. Um, I, but um, ultimately, it's an it's an organic Azo dye. And yes, Azo is a better dye, but it's still organic. So I would say go with organic, in, in organic. And I haven't seen, again, correct me if you know otherwise, I don't believe I've ever seen an inorganic layered um, CD. The M-Disc was never a CD. Uh, I'd be really curious. I mean, there's probably nothing stopping someone from creating an inorganic CD and DVD. Why would you? Because um, they've been succeeded by Blu-rays with bigger capacities. But if there was a demand, I, I'd imagine a manufacturer could do that pretty easily. Uh, it's just using different pitting, essentially. Um, so reasons to use CDs and DVDs over Blu-rays. Why why would you use them and not Blu-rays? Well, just a few reasons. To, so the idea isn't totally discounted. One, the hardware is cheaper, right? Super cheap to buy just CD and DVD capable burners these days. I was looking at ones for like $20 at internal drives for $20 and $15, like really, really cheap. So if you just wanted to burn a few CDs and say, is this, arc, is this optical media idea completely insane or not? Uh, I would go with, uh, you know, get yourself just a CD, DVD thing and a few CDs. Um, the other thing I would say, well, Blu-ray is a little bit more complicated. <sighs> with Linux, it's kind of a mess. Um, K3B and Blu-rays, lots of people have issues with them. So that's one point they have is these guys seem to just work with pretty much everything at this point. Um, and this other reason is that if you're doing archival, there's something useful about being able to, yes, you'll have more data if you do less, if you write less data per disk. Uh, but you can have, you know, stuff more separated, right? You can have the podcast for this month, go on to this CD and you 12, CD, 12 CDs a year, one month, one month per CD. If you've got a busy, bustling, successful podcast, that would be pretty reasonable to do. And you might, you might prefer to do that than write only 2% of a Blu-ray, um, or have all your stuff mixed up. So the Canadian Conservation Institute actually like the CDs. They have this uh, reference about optical media longevity. And believe it or not, if you look, you will see that the top longevity is actually for CDR. It's a gold CD with a specific die. And they say this should be good for more than 100 years. And they put the Blu-rays lower. So why do they have that? I don't know. You can ask the Canadian Conservation Institute, but there's at least someone who believes that they have longevity. Here's an example, by the way, of another uh, archival grade CD that's out there. Uh, there's quite a few of them. Not, I mean, not a huge amount, but if you dig around Google, you'll find a few. And I think they all look so, so nice, so attractive. Uh, Blu-ray getting beyond the HDL versus LTH debate that so many people, this is a bit conspiracy theory-ish. People are convinced that, uh, what is it, that all the M-Discs are just regular Blu-ray HDL. I don't believe that, but some people do. But what is the difference anyway? Well, basically, uh, inorganic is HDL and organic is LTH. Blu-rays were originally HDL and based on inorganic. Then they tried to make them LTH. Um, this type, and you'll still find them some places, LTH type, and they you can see LTH, they're organic. So they tried to kind of mimic the CD-DVD production process because I guess uh, it was cheaper. For sure it was cheaper, not just from the material standpoint, but from the production standpoint. If you make everything similar to produce, I can imagine it's cheaper economies of scale. But uh, LTH wasn't a great success from everything I've read. It was a bit finicky with compatibility. And um, it seemed just like a step backwards. So verbatim told me last week, I have the email, we only do BDR HDL. We're not doing, I don't know if that meant the whole world. I think probably actually did mean the whole world. I don't think they're making any LTH discs. Um, so yeah, you can still see them about, but why would you get, um, 
why would you go for organic when you can go for inorganic? Now, people would say, well, there's more to it than that. You can have really good organic and really bad inorganic. And you see what I mean? You can get sucked into these debates. But I would say as a general principle, it's uh, pretty well established that inorganic is better. So what is verbatim HTL? So it uses MABL, which is Metal Ablative Recording Layer. Verbatim call this a specially created inorganic recording layer on Verbatim's BDR Media to ensure prolonged stability for archival life. So oh, interesting, archival life, right? That sounds good. So basically, and again, all this stuff, there's a limit to how much information you can dredge up online. You will run into trade secrets and stuff that is just patent protected. And I haven't been able to find much about the inner workings of the mysterious metal ablative recording layer. Um, it's probably stuff verbatim don't want to tell you because why would they tell you how they make their proprietary technology so you can reverse engineer it? So, you know, there's a people will say, well, it's, the MDisc has to be the same, but I would also say, look, uh, verbatim, I have one, one quick answer to this debate. Firstly, verbatim still makes them both at different price points. I've seen some data that people get better longevity results for that. And you can't really expect verbatim to spell out the exact differences. But I, I have tried to prod them to give me a high level difference. And they uh, so far have not come through with that. So um, I don't know. I don't know. More verbatim terms made easy that you'll see if you're buying Blu-rays. Hard code just means it's got a scratch resistant coding. Searl, super eutectic recording layer. If it's rewritable, it makes less noise because it scrubs a clean better. Medidisc, uh, some standards in the medical data industry for data storage is compliant with them. But if you're not in the industry, that doesn't mean much to you. Azo, it's a different type of organic dye and it's uh, less susceptible to UV resistance. Archival grade. Uh, not a control term, as I've said. It's just something they say, and it probably means they've done something to try and make it last longer. But that could be anything. Literally could be anything. DR, so you have to, I would say you have to look a little bit beyond that. DRL, we put some gold in there to protect the recording layer, as we've seen. So what about the MDisc? Our good friend, the MDisc. The MDisc got me into archival media. I still dearly love the MDisc. I have, uh, I still use basically 90% MDisc because I, I don't uh, personally have doubts about it. And the difference for me is like, I think I get 25 M discs for 50, 60 bucks, right? So that's what, a little bit over $2 a disc. Verbatim regular Blu-ray, you can get it for like $1. But if I only burn two discs a month, it's $2, which is the, pr the price of a cu cup of coffee. So for paying $2 more a month, I put my faith in mdisc but other people don't so the mdisc controversy is kind of like on reddit i would say not just on reddit people elsewhere are kind of sus are suspicious about them um verbatim told me the other day we're going to keep making these things for more than 10 years so i think there is a future in the mdisc um mdisc millenniata went bankrupt they sold the tech to verbatim and right tech they call it a rock-like layer, but that just means it's some kind of inorganic material used. Um, uh, how BDR, HTL and MDisc BD differ substantively, I don't know. And at this point, I have to say, I don't really care. Uh, I'm not sure I'll ever find out that information. Uh, but I wouldn't, wouldn't jump to the conclusion based on tiny things like a different MID or different product packaging that you were that were being scammed by verbatim I, I, I people think that and i think that's being way too suspicious personally um but yeah you can do whatever you want you can use them or not use them uh then you have the 128 so these are actually the bit they've made 400 gig discs pioneer did one um but they never came to market we're still waiting on this one terabyte thing from photo folio photonics but that's going to need a three thousand dollar drive so the biggest optical disc that wa has been commercialized and which you can buy for not crazy amounts of money and you don't need a special drive is this thing from Sony. It's 128 gigs, not 125 like the other ones. So it's, uh, what's, what is that? It's 32 times four. Yes, that's correct. 32 gigs. It's a quad layer Blu-ray with 32 gigs a layer. You get your 128. And these are the biggest 
you know things you can find on the market i pulled these uh, screenshots from amazon japan which i'll talk about briefly uh if you the biggest one the biggest capacity was multiple people making them so you don't need to just buy sony is 100 gigs it's bdxl jvc verbatim lots of people make them um yeah i just learned this week you can buy optical media on amazon japan the japanese are like kind of the kings at certain certain tech and um i would say actually they're the kings of optical media if you think about it, not only was optical media, not only was the Blu-ray invented in Japan, but the leading innovators all seem to be Japanese, Sony, Panasonic, TDK, I could go on, but you get the idea. And Amazon Japan is kind of a weird entity because I've bought from a lot of different Amazons in my uh, in the course of my life. Uh, I've used uh, Amazon Italia, I've used Amazon Germany, I've used Amazon Turkey, I've, and this is only the last couple of years. Uh, amazon.co.uk um and they're all like generally seamless it's usually a bit weird because you can't get customer service in english so you have to like you know google translate stuff into italian if if required but they, they generally work work just fine amazon.co.jp is a bit different uh because Am japan has these weird kind of restrictions about exporting or they're quite a bureaucratic country i get the impression i would love to go absolutely especially now after learning they're big into optical um it's not i i didn't experience it just like the other amazons i had to um what did i have to do i had to submit proof of residence to get my order to send but it worked and i actually paid in yen you can pay in yen or you can pay in um usd or other currencies and i actually worked out that yen was cheaper very random is probably the only time i've ever got a bill in yen on my credit card um and they send the stuff out over dhl which is actually where i live um like shift stuff around the world in three or four days so for the same postage price as amazon us you get far far quicker logistics so it's actually been very impressive so far um i'm expecting it to come in like two or three days now you could get hit with import duties and whatnot so be careful but do your research and, and it, it is an option the shipping is about is oh i didn't i didn't finish with uh, just a couple more things here the shipping is like 27 bucks but you can play around with it and um it gets less as in if you add more stuff the shipping increases less so it actually can work even if you're just buying one item the stuff is so cheap it can actually work out you get a very good product selection including some stuff i haven't seen in the west and um if you're buying a few things it might make more sense so finally, deprecation, aren't we worried about optical not being available and why I don't think it's a concern. So firstly, there are valid use cases for optical media in 2024. Uh, the purchasing data remains relatively solid looking at Amazon. But think about this, the floppy disk is still going, going strong and that doesn't really make any sense. I mean, it's not really going strong, but you can still buy floppy disk, you can buy floppy disk readers. You get the idea. But they only hold 1.4 megabytes, the 3.5 inches ones. They are subject to data rot. Like, there's no attractiveness that I can see in the floppy disk. And yet, you can still buy it. So that tells me that the newer forms of optical, like the 128 gig disks, if we can get 200 gig disks in a few years, that would be great too. So I don't see those things actually going imminently at all. And even after they do, you've got backwards compatibility. However long you have functioning hardware that you can read them and connect them to a computer, you, you can get your data off optical. So, so long as it stays good, that is. So I actually don't think there is a like massive imminent risk here. And I made the point here that my perspective, I'm going to try to wrap up this video soon because I've reached the end of this rabbit hole and I don't want this to be an hour long presentation, but just my philosophy again, I, I don't think we can ever talk about keeping our data good forever. Even if they did offer a thousand years, I'd say, well, great, I'll keep it as on, on optical media for as long as that makes sense. And as soon as there's something that makes more sense, just as we digitized our grandparents' VHS cassettes, um, I'll move my stuff off optical onto the next thing. Same process. Um, so if you're really concerned though, some kind of things you can do, buy yourself an extra drive and stock up a little bit on uh, optical, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go insane. I, again, I, I see, especially now that I've discovered Amazon Japan, there's like a lot of stuff that's still being made uh, very much. Um, you probably will run into supply issues way before deprecation. So at that point, I'd be like, if you can't buy Blu-rays for love or money, I would say, all right, all right. 
this is the party's coming to an end so let's just kind of make our succession plan and go from there but i wouldn't lose sleep over it um so i reckon personally archival will be good for a couple of decades that's my bet uh, verbatim told me 10 years i don't know if that was uh, for public release but that's what they told me yesterday uh how, how do i speak to verbatim i've just been pestering their support people for the last couple of weeks and they've been responding to their to their credit um if you have thoughts about this leave them in the in the comments uh so here's what i actually use and do recommend i go as the m disc again because Worst case scenario, you're just getting inorganic, which is also supposed to be quite good for storage. You're getting verbatim, which is, you know, decent, although it's made in Taiwan now by CMC. But uh, if you have the money, I'd stick with MDisk personally. But uh, I also actually mix it up a bit. I use some, um, just I got the regular ones as well. They write a bit faster. They're a bit cheaper. Uh, you can do stuff like ECC and Party Daddy. We looked at we looked at this week for proactive error recovery, but I'm not sure I'm going to bother to be honest. Like minus a couple of experiments, and okay, it's cool to play around with and it's fun to know about, but yeah, is it worth the effort? And it's much better to just get stuff that is supposed to be good. You know, and you can do both. You can create party data on, on Blu-rays, but I, I'm not sure it's worth the effort for all the stuff you're putting on to uh, Arc Optical, to be completely honest. That's my feeling about it. So uh, crappy media, like your bargain bin CDs and DVDs, I would just avoid it because I was like back in the day when this was a new tech and people were using it to play CDs on their cars for, and you know, and they wanted to get like three months out of a CD or a year. Yeah, that makes sense. So they'd make cheap and cheerful optical media like it wouldn't you know and people can afford them and have fun burning at home and whatever it was the what people did back in the day but these days where optical's main use case is in data archival i would say that's they're just what's the point there's literally no, no point in putting data precious data on going to the hassle of using archival only to use stuff that's going to crap out after a few years so i would avoid the uh, the cheap stuff uh people are very opinionated on reddit especially people have ideas this way and that and you'll get the odd conspiracy theory just to make matters even stranger. Uh, I've just ordered some Blu-ray media from Amazon Japan. This is a, a nice place because, as you say, the Japanese. I think I think they're big into optical because they love um, they love uh, putting like TV and anime onto discs. That's like a thing in their culture. If you're Japanese or you've lived in Japan, let me know why they're so into optical. Or relatively speaking, it still seems to be quite a thing there. Um, Sony invented the Blu-ray um and the they have a product i just found today that i'm gonna just show you guys because i think it's actually possibly a very good option uh and you don't especially uh on amazon japan you find stuff that you don't see really in the west so like i haven't come across sony um i mean i looked them up i saw some places selling them but not common to see sony made blank media uh in western markets and um you can do translate from japanese on the on Amazon Japan and people are raving about them. They're like, these are excellent quality discs. Um, Sony also invented the Blu-ray in 2003. So I, and, and they mentioned they have an archival claim. So I actually just bought two uh, spindles of these discs. So 100 discs. And I'm not going to necessarily, I don't know if I'll replace the M discs, but um, with them or stop using M discs, but I'm going to mix them up a bit. And uh I'd actually really trust this product, uh, this this one, just because of Sony's. It seems to be they haven't fallen into the trap of outsourcing stuff to Taiwan, Taiwan, and some dubious manufacturers. There uh, seems like they're committed to. So uh, anyway, I probably uh, ask Japanese people. There's probably people who can tell you there what's good in this day and age. Um, other ones that look decent to me, um, they're in general just a much better. Mar I find a much better market on Amazon Japan, to my great surprise, than elsewhere. I love the packaging, um, but more than that, they've a lot of all the manufacturers coming out of japan and some of them like this premium product from panasonic you know they kind of stayed pretty much on the packet we've kept our manufacturing in japan we're keeping this is high quality media it costs double the price of the regular stuff but it's really good for archive and when manufacturers go out on a limb to say that i i trust them
So I think those are also kind of cool options. And, you know, by a few, you get you can get into collecting. Hey, people collect vinyl. I'm not sure why uh, why optical is uh, something that's considered stranger than to collect. Um, I'm, I'm certainly building up my own little stockpile here as, 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 as I speak. And as, and as my bank balance declines, my, as my optical collection grows. Uh, so concluding thoughts about this. Well, Optical is actually pretty decent for archival. Um, it's weird that, like, in 2024, this has problem has been kind of ignored by the by the tech industry or not given a lot of attention. It's like, you know, we've made tremendous advances in disk capacity, and yet in permanence, it's kind of frozen in time. I think that's weird, disappointing, unfortunate. But optical is a decent choice. Absolutely, I 100% think optical is a decent choice for archival. Uh, I use it. All my videos for the last three years, not just everything on the YouTube channel, some shots, some of my raw shots, pretty much all the video I care about that I've made essentially ever in my life is currently um, archived on optical media. I trust it. Um, Quality is imperative, though. This is not what you this is not stuff to cheap out on. You want to go into this looking for premium products on the market. Uh, and buy accordingly. I would go with inorganic media always. I would recommend inorganic above archival grade CDs and DVDs, but I think those are nice, and the Canadians said great things about CDs, so yeah, I'd buy you know a bit of that if you want to mix it up. HTL, Blu-rays versus the M-Disc. Uh, look, I don't know. If you believe verbatim is screwing us over and selling us just regular HTLs, you can continue to believe that. I personally don't, and I personally believe that M-Disc is the best uh, archival products possi- probably or possibly on the market today. Maybe the, the Sony discs give them a run for their money, but um, I would have a lot of faith in the M-Disc personally, and you can also buy these, by the way, on Amazon Japan. Um, and uh, there are a couple of other ones who do BDR with archival claims, as I've mentioned, and if you know of ones I missed, let me know. I'd love to see this market come to life just a little bit again, and another flourish of life, and let's get some uh, really decent uh, Blu-ray products in the market, and, you know, someone... Come on, let's get at least a 200 gigabyte disk or uh, or that 600 gigabyte that was prototyped or the terabyte. Uh, that would be a breakthrough, but I, I'm personally not counting on it. I think we're probably going to be stuck with these capacities in consumer optical uh, for the moment. And maybe they'll do optical cartridges again uh, with archival disk in. Uh, although I've heard someone commented yesterday that you can actually still get that through certain supply chains. So, But anyway, it's kind of a separate market. Cheap optical media is a false economy. I reiterate that message. Um, Remember that with optical media, all you have to pay to store your data on it is the cost of the disks and the cost of the burners and the cost of the dual cases. But those are pretty, those are once off too, right? You don't need to pay ongoing costs as as opposed to many other forms, especially cloud data. So don't, so go for the best media you can afford is my message uh, here. Other nuggets of information you might find useful, people who've been doing this kind of stuff for decades will tell you the same thing. Even the best media runs a chance of just going wrong or being destroyed, and really the best thing you can do is redundancy and duplication. 321 is always a good standard, but you can go beyond that if you want. You can do error scanning like CRC sector scans, Uh, you can do checksums and ECC data as we mentioned, but none of them are strictly necessary, and I would prioritize getting the best discs, burning them as slow as possible. Um, You know, I would prioritize that over these these things. Um, There's also a little bit of software for cataloging your discs. I discovered VVV last week, thanks to someone on Reddit. On Windows, there are a few better options. Um, If you're going to go down the route of buying the 100 gig Blu-rays or the 128, just check that your driver can do it and and expect... It might be a little bit harder. And on Linux, I've heard that BDXL, I did it through a virtual machine, but um, a $10 a pop for some of the better disks and like the M disks BDXL, I would um, I would just, you know, spend the five minutes to double check the burner can do it, your burner can do it, the software can do it. And I would, this is one case where I would not trust the Linux burners because we're just like, they're way, way, way behind um the curve in terms of what's out there on Windows and even on Mac, as far as I know. Anecdotes I've heard from people that the slimline ones are less reliable than the internal ones. Um, see, the internal ones, if you've just got a USB, 
giving the thing power um it probably is fine but especially like the usb 3.2 ones they don't need a separate power cable but uh you know it's just more robust to have a direct uh, power supply to ac so you can either go with enclosures or um what else what else can you do besides enclosures um, you can use an internal drive with an enclosure. You can use an internal drive with your computer, needless to say. And they also have some products that are kind of just basically internal drives in an enclosure sold as a product, like some of the Asus Turbo Drive stuff that uh, that looks decent. And um, remember that for archival, if you're doing this irregularly, you don't necessarily need the 16x best speeds that can be supported um so i would be less hung up on that and more hung up i've heard pioneer is considered like the best hardware manufacturer but there's also only a couple of oems on the market um and uh, i just bought a pioneer and i'm happy with it um so yeah that's kind of if you have the money their stuff is more expensive but i would tend to go with that um over basically anyone else any other manufacturer hope this was useful thank you for watching today's video if you've got uh, information or thoughts i'm finally free i've got all the stuff i know about optical media out of my brain and onto youtube so i hope this hope this educated or provided some information to someone and uh, f feed it back in the comments if you know stuff i don't or i miss stuff or you think i got stuff wrong contribute your comments thank you for watching listening have a great day